Hi, my name is Hugh Thomas. I'm the director of the Center for the Humanities, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight for our last book talk of the semester and our fifth of the year. Uh, we will be starting again next semester with five more. Uh, the first one being on January the 20th, uh, once again at eight o'clock. Uh, and it will feature uh, Professor Claire Usletti Porter of the Anthropology and Gender and Sexuality Studies Departments, who will be talking about her book, Gender, Textile Work, and Tunisian Woman. Uh, sorry, Tunisian Woman's Liberation. Um, and um, I'll, in just a minute, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Professor Britt Brogard, who will be uh, introducing the speaker, but I just want to note a couple of things. Uh, we will be um, posting a link to the book for, uh, for tonight's uh, uh, talk. Uh, and also, uh, I want to note that we will be holding questions till the end. But anytime you're interested in putting in a question, you can go down to the bottom of the screen, uh, hover over the Q&A box and type in your question. Uh, and that way uh, we can start right away on the questions uh, when the talk is done. So as I said, I'll turn it over to Professor Brogard uh, to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, Britt, you're still muted. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Britt Brogard, um, professor. Of uh, sorry, Britt, you just, uh, you got accidentally muted again, sorry. Uh, yeah, I know, you, it, <laughs> I saw it. Uh, so um, Britt Brogard from um, the Department of Philosophy. Um, so I'm here to, uh, listen to Mark Rowland's talk, but also to introduce him. Uh, so he's, um, he's a good friend of mine and he is um, now the chair of our department. Uh, he's been my colleague for a, a number of years. Uh, and he has uh, a very um, impressive uh, CV, even though it, this hasn't, the CV that I'm actually looking at um, because the only CV I could find um, was updated um, in, in 2015. So that what I'm looking at is something from 2015. He still has um, something like um, 18 books or something uh, and, and more than a hundred articles. And so um, so we can probably add um, a lot to that uh, to get to the updated CV. Uh, the other link didn't work. So uh, a lot of his books are about uh, animals uh, and, and it's one of them uh, that uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, The Philosopher and the Wolf, um, was a bestseller um, and was about um, Mark's uh, uh, animal, human animal relationship with uh, a, a real wolf that he uh, had at home and that he apparently had to bring to work because otherwise it would uh, not look like a house when he got back. But um, I, I looked at, at the, the translations. I was a little. Um, it's translated into so many languages: uh, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Chinese, German, Swedish, Portuguese again, French, so on. I did. I didn't actually see Danish on there. That's um, Denmark is my my uh, um, well, native country. So we'll have to do something about that. But he has other books as well on animal, um, the animal minds, uh, and uh, he has books on unconsciousness, uh, more generally speaking, um, and as, as well as work on uh, existentialism. Uh, he even has a novel um, that has a, an existentialist dimension. Uh, it's called A Good Life. Uh, and today he will speak um, about a book uh, that's about um, animals and persons. Uh, and the book is called Can Animals uh, Be Persons uh, published with Oxford University Press. Um, and um, it um, can be found on, on uh, Amazon. So if you Google it, um, can animals be, be person you should get to that link. So uh, welcome to, um, to Mark, turn it over to Mark. 
Uh, thank you, Britt, for that very uh, kind, kind introduction. Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen with you as, as one does. Um, here it goes. So the, um, the topic of, 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 of my talk is, can animals be persons? Um, to to ad address this, um, well, we first have to ask, what is, what is a person? And um, in common sense, I think a person is usually equated with uh, a human being. To be a person and to be a human are, the, are one and the same thing. Um, but th there are problems with, with uh, this way of thinking about persons, because if, if we think in this way, then what do we say about, uh, for example, I, I, I agonized over, over to whether, whether to go with um, Trek or uh, Wars. I ended up with Trek for some reason, but take Spock, for example. Um, Spock is not human, um, but, but, but it seems he is a person. And you might say, well, okay, Spock is, 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 is half human. Um, if you were to say that, then we could go a little further along the, the Star Trek uh, universe. Worf was, as far as, as, far as I remember, um, entirely Klingon, um, but nonetheless still seems to be uh, a person in some sense. Or switching genres quite dramatically, what about Frodo, ba Frodo Baggins? He wasn't, uh, he wasn't human, he was uh, a hobbit. Um, now, I suppose one thing that Spark and Worf and Frodo all have in common is that they're all vaguely humanoid. So you might think, well, maybe to be a person, you have to be at least humanoid. But then um, what would we say about, I don't know if anyone's seen this uh, thing, but you know, this is uh, the secret life of pets um, about a, a group of animals who get into various adventures. My, my point, um, I believe, believe it or not, there is a point, is, is, is a sort of proof of concept, if you like. Um, I'm not saying that these individuals exist because that would be insane, They're entirely fictional, of course. Uh, my point is that if individuals of this kind did exist, then um, they would be persons in at least one sense of um, person. So if that's true, um, if that's true, then a person is not necessarily the same as a human being. They could be persons who are not human beings. And um, they could also, in fact, be human beings who are not persons. If, if I were to suffer some horrible misadventure uh, after this talk, my, my brain is destroyed, but I'm kept alive by various machines, I would still be a human being. But um, it's arguable that I would not be, be a person anymore. So a person and human being, they're not the same thing at all. There could be persons who are not human beings. The question is, and that's, that's the question of uh, this, this talk, is whether in fact um, there are any persons who are not human beings. And I'll, I'll, I'll argue that uh, yes, there are in fact um, quite a lot of them. So this, one of the first people to clearly distinguish um, the concept of a human being and the concept of a person was uh, the 17th century empiricist, English empiricist philosopher, John Locke. And Locke famously, um, de famously defined a person as this. A, a person is, says Locke, a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and seems to me to be essential to it, it being impossible to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive. Um, there's a lot in that, but they basically, it, what's in here falls into um, three different strands. On, on the one hand, there's, um, well, first of all, there's the idea of consciousness. Um, the second strand is, is uh, cognition, thinking, intelligence, uh, reason. And the third strand that Locke cites is a kind of self-awareness, the ability to consider itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. So, so a person on, on Locke's conception 
is, is a being, a creature in which these three strands um, coalesce. So the first thing we, we, we can look at then, taking, taking up the first of, uh, of Locke's strands, is um, whether animals are, are conscious. Now in philosophy, uh, this, this, this is René Descartes, the, um, the father of modern philosophy, who um, was, was, was a, a very good philosopher, I think, but, but um, probably didn't know too much about animals. Um, Descartes is famous for, well, he's famous for a few things, but there's a certain conception of animal that's, uh, of what animals are that's uh, associated with Descartes. Perhaps a little unfairly, I'm not sure, but, um, and it's the idea that animals are, are essentially uh, automata. They're, they're like, they're mechanisms and inside there are various parts, that, but it's a purely sort of mechanistic conception of what an animal is. There's, there's, no, there's no mental life, there's no thought, feeling, imagination, consciousness, nothing like that. The, um, the lights are on in the sense that the, the body is doing its bodily things, um, but uh, there's, there's no one home in the sense that uh, there's, no, there's no conscious life at all. Um, and D Descartes' conception of, of animals was very popular at the time, but also he exerted quite a, um, quite a grip on the development of um, the area of psychology, comparative psychology that deals with, um, that deals with animals. This, this grip has, has started to lessen in, in recent decades. And um, in 2012, uh, there emerged from, from a conference in Cambridge, what, what became known as the um, Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness written by Jack Panskett, Panksepp and uh, Christoph Koch and, and various other people. Um, and the Cambridge De Declaration on Consciousness was, uh, was uh, basically uh, ends like this. The, the absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing effective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of conscious states, along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses also possess these neurological substrates. So, so this was a de declaration signed by the sort of great and good of the neuroscientists um, in the world of um, 2012. So the sort of thing they had in mind, right? Um, when, when they wrote this declaration, uh, starts off with, with, with an examination of what's responsible for consciousness in um, humans. And there are three, there are three sort of um, important features of, of uh, consciousness as it, as it occurs in, in human beings. So first of all, waking consciousness, the sort of consciousness that involves being awake rather than asleep, is correlated with low level irregular neural activity of a frequency ranging from roughly 20 to 70 Hertz. Unconscious states, deep sleep, anesthesia, vegetative states and so on, are correlated with higher amplitude and more regular waves at a frequency of less than four Hertz. So that's one of the differentiating features of consciousness and of conscious and non-conscious states in human beings is that kind of activity. Also characteristic of uh, consciousness in humans is, uh, is heavy, the heavy involvement of the thalamus and cortex. So uh, damage to the thalamus um, results in a loss of state of consciousness, state of being conscious as, as opposed to uh, asleep or unconscious. And damage to the sensory cortex damages specific conscious features. Like you might, you might lose the ability to see colors or um, experience faces as faces you might lose the ability to um, <coughs> perceive motion and so on and so on. These, these are associated with, with activity in the, um, in the cortex. So while the thalamus is responsible for being conscious in general, being conscious in general, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the cortex sort of fashions that consciousness into, in, into sort of specific um, forms. 
Uh, thirdly, consciousness, uh, consciousness is associated with widespread activation in the brain. It spreads rapidly from the sensory cortex to parietal, prefrontal, and medial temporal lobes of the cortex. So it's, it spreads rapidly throughout the, um, the cortex. So the Cambridge Declaration, the Cambridge case for animal consciousness as it is, is, based, is based on this. In humans, uh, consciousness is correlated with widespread relatively fast, low amplitude interactions in the thalamocortical region of the brain. And the case for consciousness in animals then is simple. It's, it's that we find essentially the same activity, <coughs> excuse me, in many, many animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, octopodes. Um, the next strand, the next strand in um, in Locke's definition of a person appeals to things like thinking, intelligence, and reason. And um, Descartes once again was uh, very vocal on 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 the lack of these sorts of things in animals. Um, so. In a, in a letter to the Marquis of Newcastle, uh, he, he, he says this, if you teach a magpie to say good day to its mistress when it sees her approach, this can only be by making the utterance of this word the expression of one of its passions. For instance, uh, it will be an expression of the hope of eating if it's always being given a tidbit when it says, when it says it. Similarly, all the things that dogs, horses and monkeys are taught to perform are only expressions of their fear, their hope, their joy, and consequently can be performed without any thought. So on Descartes' view, there is, there is no thought. Animals don't think. They simply react on the basis of various sorts of um, passions, as he, as he puts it. A near contemporary, not quite contemporary, but a near contemporary of, of Descartes, the Scottish philosopher David Hume, um, had a very different, uh, a very different uh, opinion. He says, next, so he writes in, in the Treatise of Human Nature, one of his, probably his most famous book, next to the ridicule of denying an evident truth is that of taking much pains to defend it. And no truth appears to me more evident than that beasts are endowed with thought and reason as well as men. The arguments are in this case so obvious that they never escape the most stupid and ignorant. They escaped Descartes, but, but that's, that's another, uh, another thing. So I think, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that um, the development of, you know, the, the, the kind of evidence we've amassed in, in, um, in the last few decades would, would support Hume um, a lot more than, than, than they do Descartes. So here is, um, Alex, what matter? This is this is Alex the parrot. I always like to show this to people who who attempted to believe that Descartes might be true. This is um, Alex, a very a very you know rather famous parrot, um, doing doing some cool things. Whoa, that's right. How many? Ciao. That's right. You're a good boy. No, sweetie. No, you can't go back yet. You can. Do you want some water? Do you want some water? Or are you just asking to interrupt? Are you just asking to interrupt? I know. Go back. I know. What color bigger? What color bigger? Green. Oh, you're a good boy. Okay, Alex. Look. Well, look what I got for you. Hey, look. Look at all these neat toys. Look. Hey, look. Can you tell me? On the tray. How many green block? Green block. Good parrot. Two green block. Two. Good parrot. One of the things Alex doesn't have is a knee-jerk response to the types of objects that you present him. He can look at two objects and answer several different types of questions about those objects, or he can look at a novel collection of items and answer questions about that collection. 
What this shows us is that he really understands what those questions mean. The whole thing. Thanks, Alex. Okay. You're right. Good boy. Alex describing objects. Alex saying, Polly want more than a cracker. Is this what you want? I want banana. Carrot. Good birdie. I want corn. Soft corn. Soft corn. Good parrot. We've got rock corn. That's dried corn. And we've got soft corn, too. Cold. It's cold. Yes, it's cold. It's from the refrigerator. Go pick up corn. Well, no, I'm not going to pick up the corn you threw down. Using his beak, he could tell you what matter objects were made of. Rock? Good boy. Rock. What matter? What matter, Alex? Whoa. Whoa. That's good right. Boy. Whoa. That's good right. Boy. Whoa. And amazingly, on a tray, he could tell you the number of squares from the number of balls, the number of each color. How many blue balls? Four. Four is right. Good parrot. He's choosing from among all the possible answers. Remember, he sees this object. If he was giving a knee-jerk response, he would say paper every time he saw this thing. He tried to restrain himself when student parrots like this one got it wrong. What matter? Then Alex would interject with his equivalent of duh. What matter? What? As parrots go, he was simply Einstein. I'll leave the rest of um, ABC's sort of interpretation of, of the, I mean, this is, um, we could, it's, it's common to think of, of, of rationality as dividing up into two different forms. Uh, the first form is what's known as uh, causal reasoning. And there's a reason, there's a picture of a new Caledonian crow here. Um, ca causal reasoning involves understanding the properties of objects and how these properties affect uh, or may be utilized in the pursuit of one's goals. So crows, and in particular the New Caledonian crows, which have been studied more than others, are very, very adept at, at, at um, causal reasoning of this sort. And so, for example, uh, in a classic experiment, uh, it involved a tube of water. Um, floating on the water in the tube was a peanut but the peanut was out of the reach of the beaks of the crows. So what they learned to do was to drop pebbles in the water, thus raising the level of the water, thus giving them access to the, uh, the peanut. Um, they didn't do the same thing when the tubes were filled with sand, thus you know, exhibiting uh, an understanding of um, the sort of displacement properties of water, of, of liquids, but not, but not solids. And they're also very good at not, not just, um, not just um, using tools, they're also very good at constructing them. Um, so there, there's another well-known experiment which involves the crow's attempts to reach a piece of food, which they can get by, depre by pressing um, on a, a sort of platform. The platform falls the, and the food rolls down into an accessible um, place. Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the crows can't reach the platform to push it with their beaks, and so they have to um, use a tool. There is no tool available, but they can make one by putting together two different things. On the one hand, there's a short piece um, which is hanging on a string, which they then take out. They then put that into another longer piece of wood, um, which then forms um, a, a lever long enough for them to depress the platform on which the food rests. And, uh, and so on, and get, and get the food. So this is, this is a case of, of construction of tools as, and not simply their use. Chimpanzees are also quite adept at making, um, at making tools. They, 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 they fashion spears uh, to um, hunt bush babies. They, they develop perforating tools plus sticks to get at termite mounds and so on and so on. Possibly my favorite though, I think, because um, you, you wouldn't really expect this, or at least I wouldn't. Um, the American alligator, alligator mississippiensis, uh, is, is very clever. It's a clever piece of causal reasoning. During nesting season, the, the alligator will try and arrange for various sticks to be resting on its snout. Uh, it then just floats around in the water, looks like a log, 
the bird come, the bird appears, thinks, oh, the, these, these twigs will do nicely for the nest that I'm building as it is nesting season. And then, you know, this is the, um, the, the eventual result. They only do it during nesting season, thus sort of showing, displaying some kind of understanding of the difference between uh, different, part, different seasons of the, uh, the year. Um, it, it's common, philosophers like to distinguish uh, from causal reasoning, they like to talk about what, what they call logical reasoning, which um, I'm not sure there's, there's a huge amount of difference, but, but the, the, the standard view is, is, is that there is. So um, there's, there's a, perhaps an apocryphal tale um, associated with the Greek uh, philosopher Chrysippus, who describes a dog tr uh, running along a track um, after a, a rabbit and, um, or some, some creature, I forget exactly which one. The track forks in, into three different, um, three different paths. It sniffs the first path, sniffs the second, doesn't smell the rabbit on, on either of those, and so immediately runs down the remaining path without bothering to sniff. So this is, a, this is an example of um, what's known as a di disjunctive syllogism. And it, it's more familiar, simpler form. A disjunctive syllogism goes like this, either A or B, not A, therefore B. And um, various animals have, have proved uh, adept, some more than others admittedly, but various animals have, have, have exhibited this kind of reasoning, great apes, monkeys, ravens, and dogs. <laughs> the standard experiment involves, you know, you have two containers, you, sh you let the animals see that you're putting food in one of them, but you don't, they, they don't get to see precisely which one. Then you show them what, you show the container that um, doesn't have food, and then you give them the option of, 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 of picking out which container they want. They go for the one that, that um, uh, they didn't see. So um, great apes can do this, monkeys, ravens, dogs. I mean, dogs are an interesting case in that they, um, they can do it, but, but they'd rather not. Um, they, they'd rather us to do it for them. So they only do it under conditions where there are no humans present and the, 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 um, the jars containing the food and so on are, are manipulated remotely. Dogs, dogs can think very, very well, but they, they often don't, don't like to. Um, so there's ample evidence that reasoning abilities, um, certainly causal reasoning, and in some cases, well, logical reasoning, these are spread quite widely throughout the, um, the, animal, the animal kingdom. The third, the third strand of, the third strand of Locke's definition of a person involved um, self-awareness. And, Locke's definition went like this. A, a person must have the ability to consider itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. And the standard test for self-awareness in, um, in uh, contemporary comparative psychology is, is, is the mirror test devised by Gordon Gallup in 1970, the, the mirror or mirror self-recognition test. So in the mirror test, you, you take an animal, uh, ideally you anesthetize it so it doesn't know you're doing something, and then you, you, um, you put a mark on it um, using dye of some sort. And uh, when it wakes up, you give it a mirror and you, you try to ascertain if the animal shows any um, interest in, in the mark. And um, some, some animals, they do. The idea being that if, 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 if the animal sort of inspects the mark or tries to touch it or things like that, they rec whilst looking in the mirror, they recognize that the mark is something that's on them and therefore they must have some sort of conception self-awareness. Self Various animals have passed the mirror test. Um, the great apes, they, 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 they generally do quite well on it. Gorillas are the exception which, um, which, which do struggle. Uh, Probably the reason for that is that gorillas do not like eye contact at all. They regard it as threatening. And so when they see a strange gorilla in a mirror, they're not going to, well, they're going to look away. Uh, elephants, a small number of elephants have also passed the mirror test. Dolphins and orcas uh, 
have done so also. Um, the Eurasian magpie is quite good at it, apparently. Certain fish, manta rays, have been patiently building a case for quite some time. Also, um, rats um, seem to, 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 to pass the mirror test. Um, what one, what one thing you can say about the mirror test is that it's, um, it's heavily oriented towards visual creatures such as ourselves. Um, so an interesting variation on the mirror test, because dogs reportedly, I mean, don't get me started on this, but dogs reportedly don't pass mirror tests. I think that's probably wrong, but um, this person, Mark Beckoff, uh, a professor of biology at the University of Colorado, emeritus now, I think, devised uh, what was in effect um, a sort of an olfactory version of of the mirror test, which, which became known as the yellow snow test. So living in Colorado, there's a lot of snow around for quite a bit of the year. And so Mark came up with this idea. He would, uh, he would um, take yellow snow that uh, his dog Jethro, I think Jethro was the dog on the left, actually, if I remember rightly, had produced um, and then and, and shovel it and move it around. And so Jethro on, 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 on later walks would encounter both um, his own urine and the urine of other dogs. And he wouldn't be able to identify his own urine from remembering that he deposited it there earlier uh, in the day. And then Mark sort of uh, examined the amount of time that Jethro spent sniffing his own, his own yellow snow versus the yellow snow of other dogs and discovered that he spent a lot more time on the yellow snow of, of other dogs, which he argues, and I think this is, this is contestable, but he argued this, this ex shows a form of um, self-awareness. Um, so the dog is, is, is basically recognizing mine versus not mine, which is exhibited in the differential amount of attention he spends on each. Um, so he's identifying mine versus not mine, and to identify mine versus not mine, you have to have some idea of me, some idea of um, yourself. So this is a kind of olfactory version of, uh, of the mirror test. Um, I think there's a, there's a general, there's a general um, limitation to the mirror test, which, which goes beyond the, the vision versus olfaction kind of issue. And, you, you can see what it is by asking, what does, what does mirror self-recognition show? What, if you pass the mirror test, what exactly does that show? And what it seems to show is that you have the ability to think thoughts about yourself. You see yourself in the mirror and you think, yep, that, that's me. Okay, so that's a thought. You, you have the ability to, to have these thoughts about yourself, which is what um, in a certain tradition of philosophy is sometimes called reflective self-awareness. You're having a thought about yourself, and this is one form that um, this is one form that self-awareness can take. But it, really, it doesn't seem to be the sort of thing that um, that Locke had in mind when he when he gave his definition of a person. As Locke said, a person is a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection, and can consider itself the same thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and seems to me to be essential to it, it being impossible to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive. So, take the it being impossible to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive bit of Locke's definition. And, and, and think about this, when you see something, it doesn't really matter what it was. When, when you see something, must you also be thinking to yourself that you're seeing it? When you see something, must you also simultaneously be thinking that you're seeing it? And it seems, it seems implausible as a matter of basic phenomenology. Most of the time we just go around, we see things and we act on the basis of what we see, but we don't, go, we, 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 we don't give much thought to what we're doing. So if the awareness of self um, that Locke had in mind is part of seeing, it seems it must be a different kind of awareness, not, not, not the reflective awareness of the sort tested for by mirror self-recognition. 
So the question then is, well, what is this other kind of awareness? Um, see what this is, consider, consider I'm, we're somewhat sort of constrained by the limitations of, of technology. If, 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 if I were present before you at, at Books and Books, then I, I might have a bottle of something or other. I could, I could do this with a little more, um, uh, a little, with, with a little more um, a plume. But here's a bottle of, of my favorite wine, largely because it doesn't cost that much. Uh, from the Fougere region, uh, a bottle of Shadow de la Liquiere, the Vie Vigne. Um, imagine I was standing in front of you holding this bottle. You would, in all likelihood, um, see it as a bottle. It's unlikely that you might see it as, say, a bottle facade, a cardboard cutout of a bottle. Um, but it's also true that the part of the bottle you can see is the part that's facing you, which might be exactly the same as what's captured by a bottle facade. So the question is, well, why do, you, why do we see things as objects, okay? Why do we see things as objects when only the, only the part of the object which is oriented towards us, only that part can we see? Why do we see things as objects and not as two-dimensional facades? And there is an answer. Um, proposed, among others, by this rather sort of severe looking gentleman on the right, that's Edmund Husserl, the, um, the father of the modern phenomenological tradition. Um, why does the bottle appear as a bottle? Why does the bottle, uh, wh why do objects appear as objects and not simply as, as surfaces? And Husserl's answer, and this was developed through the phenomenological tradition, still popular today, um, is the key to the answer is what's known as sensory motor expectations. Um, where a sensory motor expectation is an expectation concerning the relation between what we can call contingencies and consequences. A contingency is that something happens either to the bottle or to me. Perhaps the bottle move, is moved to the left, to the right, up or down, perhaps the bottle is rotated. These are all, these are all contingencies, <coughs> things that might happen to the bottle. Things that might happen to me or I might do, or I might close my eyes, turn my head and so on. These are all contingencies in the sense that they're things that may happen. Um, consequences are the consequences for the appearance of the bottle when these things happen. So there are contingencies, things that happen, and, the, and consequences for the appearance of um, the bottle. So a sensory motor expectation is an expectation how um, given contingencies, certain contingencies, certain things happening, will have certain consequences for the way things appear. So imagine, for example, the bottle, imagine I'm rotating the bottle. Um, the idea is you see it as a bottle because you have, you've anticipated, even if I don't rotate it, you've anticipated what will happen to the appearances. The, the front label will gradually disappear from view to replace by the label on the back if there is such a thing and so on. Um, the key is, uh, in a similar sort of vein, you've, you've anticipated, you've, you, you expect that if I were to move the bottle four foot to the right or four foot to the left, then the way the bottle appears would change, which is in a way that's consistent with the, consistent with the presence of a bottle rather than a cardboard cutout of a bottle. If I rotate a cardboard cutout, then soon the thin edge quickly becomes um, uh, visible to you. Whereas if I rotate a bottle, different things happen. But the thing about these sorts of, sen th th these are sensory motor expectations. And the thing about these is that the, sub the person who has them is always implicated in these, these expectations. It's not the fact that the bottle has moved four foot in one direction or four foot in another um, that's crucial. It's the fact that this is done while you are standing in a certain place. Or you imagine if, um, if the bottle were rotated um, the appearances would change in a certain way, the label would disappear and so on. But that assumes that you are not orbiting the bottle at the same rotational rate. If you were, then the appearances wouldn't change in those sorts of ways. So you, in this sense, are implicated in um, these sensory motor expectations. 
And this sort of implicit sense of self gives rise to, to um, another kind of self-awareness, uh, sometimes called pre-reflective, non-positional, as Sartre called it, pre-intentional, I prefer. But um, the idea is that this kind of self-awareness, this awareness of yourself is involved in having any conscious experience at all. Um, so that any creature that has conscious experience is also going to be aware of itself. So in conclusion, um, many animals are persons in the sense that many animals are conscious, they're rational, and they're self-aware, unified subjects of a mental life. I didn't talk much about unity. I think that's a consequence of self-awareness, but um, this is the sense I have in mind when I talk about animals as persons. They're conscious, rational, self-aware subjects of a mental life. All these features coalesce in, in more than a few um, animals. And in that sense, animals are um, persons. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And we've already got some questions, so uh, we can jump right in. Uh, so the first question uh, is, uh, I think it was Descartes who offered the example of the magpie saying, animals only behave as related to one of their passions, such as the desire for a treat. But can't we say the same thing about humans, that everything we do is related to passion, fear, joy, Sorry, you broke up there and slightly, Hugh, sorry. Um, so that everything is uh, related to a passion, fear, joy, etc. cetera. Well, um, perhaps, a lot more, perhaps a lot more of human life is related to those things than, than we sometimes realize. But it also seems that we're, um, we, we can do things like think. You know, we can make plans. Sometimes they're mundane plans about what I'm going to have for dinner and how I'm going to get it. And other, other times they're sort of... Um, much more grandiose long-term plans, my plans for the future and so on and so on. So um, we, we, we are you know, both emotional creatures uh, and, uh, and rational in, in both, I think, the causal and the logical sense. We can reason as well as, um, as, well as feel. So if you want to say, well, that humans are simply emotional creatures, then, then the task would be to explain how we can sort of do the things we do, make these long-term plans like going to university and so on and so on, if we're just purely creatures of emotion. Thanks. Uh, next question is, takes us uh, back into history. What do you think about Aristotle's way of thinking of animals, especially dolphins, and about Albertus Magnus, who was heavily influenced by Aristotle? I, well, you have you, a great question. Um, but it has, you have made a disadvantage in that I do not know what Albertus Magnus said about dolphins. So if you can tell me what he said, I'll tell you what I think about it. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> perhaps the person who asked that question, uh, actually the, the, was about Aristotle uh, was about uh, dolphins, but I'll ask the person who asked that question to uh, elaborate. And yeah, please, no, I, I'd, I'd like to know what Aristotle said about dolphins, actually. Okay, so, so we'll come back to that. Um, with those individuals who are human but not uh, persons due to their lack of cerebral ability, how do we handle their rights as opposed to those non-human animals who have more conscious rationality than the humans themselves? Um, I, I, on my view, um, anything which is sentient in the sense that it's conscious, it's capable of suffering and enjoying, things, um, th various things happen to it. It's capable of, uh, as a result, suffering or enjoying those things. That, that being has moral standing for precisely that reason. So I, I, I think that sentience is enough to give, to, to give a creature some kind of moral standing. Um, I think w when we have, when we have um, more complex creatures, then I think there, there, are, there are additional harms that they can suffer, which, which, which will force us to um, think, about, think carefully about, um, what, about how we should treat them. So for example, uh, just to take one example, um, one of the implications of, of thinking of animals as, as persons is that they can, have, they can suffer certain harms that are essentially harms that exist through time. 
So you imagine, say, the boredom that, that results from um, long-term captivity. Um, that's, that kind of thing, can, can, uh, that kind of suffering um, is available to a creature that is unified, uh, that has a unified mental life through time, and it isn't available to a creature that exists only in, in moments. So there, I think there are certain additional harms that, that force us to, um, to, to uh, not reevaluate, but, but rethink um, what we do to animals um, based on their sort of level of, of complexity. That was, that was a horrible way of putting it, sorry. But the idea is, okay, if you, if you can suffer or enjoy, you have moral standing. If you're more complex, if you're a unified subject of a life through time, then there are certain, certain other things that have to be taken into consideration when we consider what, we, what, what obligations we have towards you. Well, the next question in some ways broadens this out. Uh, what are the consequences um, sorry, I had to scroll up a little bit. What are the consequences of recognizing animals as persons? How does this understanding impact the human relationship with animals? Uh, again, I, it, it does. I think that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's a broadening of, of, of the previous question. Um, we, we owe certain things to persons that we don't, to non-persons. That's not to say we can treat non-persons in any way we we want, if they can suffer and enjoy that, that's enough to constrain what we do. But there, there are various, um, there are harms and there are benefits that are available to, to, um, to persons that are not available to more, as we might think of it, momentary um, creatures. So there, there's an idea of a sort of a life well lived, you know, what, what, what would be a good life for um, a companion animal, a dog or a cat or something like that. Those sorts of issues arise with, with um, persons, unified subjects of mental lives through time that don't arise with, with more uh, simple, simple creatures. Not surprisingly, we have lots of questions in similar veins. So the next one is, do animals have moral agency? I hold my dog responsible if she snacks, uh, if she sneaks on the table to get leftovers. Right, yeah. Um, this, this, this was actually, uh, this was actually um, the topic of um, the Can Animals Be Persons book was part of a two book, we well, can't call two books a series, but a two book set, if you like. The, the, the first book was called Can Animals Be Moral? Um, where I argued, you probably guessed that yes, yes, they can, at least on, on some ways of thinking about morality, uh, animals are capable of moral behavior. Um, does this mean that animals have moral agency? Well, moral agency involves being held responsible for, for what you do. And uh, at one time, you know, criminal trials involving animals were, were, were quite common. Um, I, I, assume, I assume we don't really want to go back to those days. Um, so I drew a distinction between what I called um, the moral subject and the moral agent. And a moral subject is something which acts on the basis of moral reasons. Um, in the case of animals, this would be emotions of a certain sort, emotions which track the, the well-being of others. Um, so animals are capable of moral motivation, but they're not, um, they're not, they can't be morally responsible for what they do. So in the, in the history of philosophy, the, the issue of motivation and the issue of responsibility, I think, have been unacceptably run together. So the, the task of that book basically was to, to draw these apart and say, no, you, you, can make sense of, um, you can make sense of motivations being good ones or bad ones, even if you cannot hold responsible the person who has those motivations. So I think it makes perfect sense to think that animals can um, be morally motivated, they can have good or bad motivations, even though they can't be held morally responsible for what they do. Okay, um, and now we're gonna to turn to the question of, uh, can animals have personalities? Does being a person entail having personality? <sighs> oh, I, I, I think yes, absolutely. It's, it's, I think it's very clear that animals, um, animals have personalities. Uh, sometimes my, my dog, I think he made an appearance, but that's when the screen share thing was on. 
Um, I have a dog and he's, he's, he's clearly deeply paranoid. It's part of his, his, um, his lineage, you know, it's part, part of what he is. Um, I, I, and, and I think um, this, this, uh, and this, this crops up in sort of discussions of dog, dog training, for example. Um, it makes perfect sense to say that a, a dog is paranoid. Um, paranoid in a fairly, fairly um, sort of straightforward sense. They think everybody they don't know is out to get them, kind of paranoid. Um, I've known dogs like that. I have one who's, who's a bit like that now. Um, but but the, the, sort of, the sort of adjectives we use to describe personalities um, make, uh, are easily applicable, I think, to, to many animals once you, once you get to know them. The next question goes back a little bit to some of the earlier ones. Um, are you aware of the non-human rights project defending elephants, chimpanzees, and other animals in court requesting that they be granted personhood? Yes, you faded out. I am. Um, I am aware of it. Now, this, there, is, um, there are different senses of person, right? And the sense that's most relevant to the non-human uh, non uh, rights project which, which, which I, I fully support, um, is the legal sense of person. So legally you're a person if, if your status as such is enshrined and uh, enshrined in statutes, okay? Um, this doesn't always have to make logical sense. Various things have been given that status. Ships had that status at one time, corporations and so on. Um, so I think as, as, as Oliver Wendell Holmes put, the life of the life of the law is, 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 not, is not logic or reason or something like that. It's, it's, it's to do with all sorts of historical kind of uh, contingencies and so on that we, we end up with those sorts of characterizations. So what the people of the non-rights, uh, the, 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 um, that, the non-human, um, non-human rights project run by Stephen Wise and various others, is that they're arguing for animals having the legal status of a person. So what, what I was concerned with, with here is more what we might call, um, though possibly an advisor, be what we might call a metaphys the metaphysical concept of person. What is a person? Irrespective of whether something is recognized as a person in the law, um, what, is, what is a person? So when um, there was a chimpanzee, um, isolated in a garage in, uh, I think it was somewhere up, up, upstate New York that they were trying to get um, legal rights for. I would argue that um, <coughs> that chimpanzee, chimpanzee whose name escapes me, unfortunately, um, is metaphysically a person. He satisfies the conditions for personhood, uh, consciousness, cognition or rationality, self-awareness, and a few other things I didn't talk about tonight. Um, even though it's not currently recognized as a legal person. Um, so legal personhood is, 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 is always um, shifting and it's not always um, logical, but whether or not that poor chimpanzee ever gets um, accorded the status of a legal person, uh, that chimpanzee is, is already um, a, a, a metaphysical person in the sense I talked about tonight. Okay, uh, next question is, I have had, sorry, I have had interactions with domesticated animals, which they seem to be persons, but what about wild creatures? Do you know of instances in which they seem to be persons? Um, it depends what you mean, because the, the, this can be understood as a question about individual wild animals. Um, of which I, I, I have little sort of acquaintance, uh, especially lately, or um, a question about sort of species of animals. So we can talk about whether, for example, um, so we can talk about whether chimpanzees, for example, pass the mirror test. They seem to do so. Okay, that, that, that's, a, that's, that's a statement about chimpanzees as a whole. Okay. Um, or we can understand the question about individual animals, which I couldn't possibly answer. But the question always basically amounts to this. If, if an animal of a certain species passes um, or meets the criteria of personhood, 
consciousness, rationality, self-awareness, then it is, it is a person. I was also sort of thinking of Jane Goodall's work when I was uh -huh. that question. Uh, the next question actually relates more to the issue of species as opposed to individuals. So since there are varying degrees of intelligence among different species, is it safe to say not all animals can be considered persons? Yeah. Um, animal, animal is a very strange category, right? So, so nothing I'm saying here should be interpreted as saying that all animals are persons. Um, animal is a very strange category because it, because it's it, what it amounts to is basically non-human animal. We don't we don't typically carve up biological categories in terms of that kind of negation, right? And so there is no you know, non-canine animal, non-feline animal. We typically don't think in those terms, but non-human animal we're very comfortable with. So Descartes, who I, who I mentioned a couple of times in the, um, in the talk, had this argument um, that animals couldn't have souls, which he equated with having a mind, which he equated with reason. And his argument was, well, if, if, if you um, if you accept that animals have souls, then you have to accept that all animals have souls. So, you know, and this seems implausible, he said, when you apply it to things like sponges, <laughs> right? So the idea that, you know, what, whatever you can say about, um, whatever you can say about a sponge, you can say about a chimpanzee is insane. And um, we, we got to this position because we think that animal, uh, non-human animal denotes uh, a sort of genuine, uh, genuine category. It's, it's, it's a category we made up basically to elevate ourselves above our, other animals and it does, does no other work really. But it, it is logically perilous in the sense that um, we try to lump everything together and think, okay, if, 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 if one animal has reason, is capable of causal or logical reasoning, then all animals must be capable of that. That's just, a, that, that's not a viable idea. You seem to be doing a pretty good job of sort of leading on to the next question, even though I'm <laughs> order rather than <laughs> trying to lump them. Um, and I'll just note, when, uh, even though we're going on nine, I think we'll go over a little bit because uh, we have lots of questions left, although I don't think we'll be able to get to all the questions. Obviously, if anybody needs to do something at nine, you can just quietly leave the meeting. Uh, but the next question is, your conclusion is that animals are person. Persons, do you mean that certain or specified animals portray human traits and does not humanness contain other features such as morals? Yeah, no, I, what, I, what my argument was based on was the idea which, which you know, derives from Locke is that we can't, um, we can't equate being a person with being a human. So when I say that animals are persons, I don't mean that they have human traits in the sense that they have traits only humans could have, because that wouldn't make any sense. So what I mean is that animals satisfy the conditions, um, the conditions you have to satisfy in order to qualify as a person. So the conditions are consciousness, rationality, and self-awareness, and a, a few others, as I said. But um, to, then the question, well, do, do humans have other traits such as morals? I think, well, yes, morality is, is, is one of, one of uh, our human traits. But that previous book I mentioned, Can Animals Be Moral, is, um, is an attempt to show that animals can also have moral traits in at least some senses of, of moral. So while, while, animal, while, while uh, animals can't be moral in all the ways that humans can, they can certainly be moral in some of the ways that humans can. So the next question is from your predecessor. So it's a little more technical. Uh, uh, your predecessor is chair uh, of the philosophy department. In the case of uh, sensorimotor expectations, don't we need to have previous experience with the kinds of objects in question to be able to have any expectations about them? If I've never seen a wine bottle, I would not expect to see a label on the back if the bottle were rotated. rotated. What point are the expectations actually formed? Oh, um, it's it's a question that that Husserl, you know, the good phenomenologist that he was, had had no interest in whatsoever, actually, Otavio. But um, the the general idea is no. Let's suppose I had never seen a wine bottle before, um, but uh, I have seen bottles. 
then I would have certain expectations. Maybe the bottles that I'd seen before will label this for some reason. And, um, but I said, I'd, I'd have certain expectations about how um, appearances would change in the light of certain circumstances. So to see something as a bottle is, is a fair, as a wine bottle, especially to see something as a uh, Shadow de la Liquier Vie Vine wine bottle, right? That, that presupposes quite a lot of past experience, but the general point was to do with, with seeing things as objects. Why do we see things as sort of um, spatial, spatial objects when we're only presented with the parts of those objects, the surfaces of those objects that are facing us? Um, when, when, I, when, I see, um, uh, when I see a car, for example, um, there's a part of the car that's facing me. This is, this is the part of the car that I'm in direct visual contact with. But it would be quite rare for me to think, oh, that's a car facade, a cardboard cutout of a car, unless I were in certain unusual circumstances. So why do I see it as a car? Well, I anticipate that if I were to do various things, walk around it, then other parts of the car would become visible um, in a way that wouldn't happen if it were a car facade or car, cardboard cutout. Um, the issue of the complexity of the experience uh, is tied to things like experiential history. If you've never seen a car before, then your expectations must be quite different. But to see it as an object at all involves certain basic expectations about how appearances will change in certain circumstances. It's the general idea. I'm going to take two more questions, even though there's a lot left. Um, there's something unintuitive about the conclusions, conclusion that animals are persons. Much more intuitive is the inverse. People are animals. Why not simply focus on adjusting or expanding the definition of person to capture what might differentiate us? Um, sorry, I, you, you cut out slightly at the end. I didn't quite catch the last part. Sorry. Um, so why not simply focus on adjusting or expanding the definition of person to capture what might differentiate us? Right. Um, we are animals. That's clear. Humans are animals. There's no, there's no, no doubt about that. Um, to, to work out which things are persons and which things are not is a kind of it's a kind of, um, you might think of it as allocating things to certain regions of logical space. So there is this concept, the concept of a person, um, the, con the version of that I prefer is locks. And then the, the task is to work out what exactly falls under this concept. Is it only humans that fall under it or do certain other things do? And so you, can, so you combine the definition of the concept which involves consciousness, rationality, self-awareness, and so on. And then you, you bring in sort of uh, what you know from empirical studies of animals and work out the extent to which they fit this concept. And so my argument is basically they fit this concept rather well and therefore they should be regarded as persons. None of that, of course, excludes, um, excludes um, humans from being animals, but that is a different, a different, uh, a different issue. Humans are both animals and persons. And um, other animals are animals and persons, but not human. So we have not, alas, learned what Aristotle thought about dolphins. Um, but before I ask the last question, I'll note that somebody gave some information about the caged chimp. The caged chimp is a legal person. A habeas petition is searched by Brett Snyder, Esquire, uh, in 2013, a New York. Uh, chimpanzees involved in a strange legal battle. Tommy, that's the one, yeah, yeah, Tommy, that was his name. Okay, to, to, to turn to the last question, um, the questioner was wondering if you might engage with any non-Western philosophical traditions that arrive at similar conclusions regarding animals as persons. Yes, I, I, I did, I was, I was invited uh, on, uh, I was invited to engage in precisely that on a blog um, called Pea Soup, which is a philo philosophical blog with, with um, quite a bit of Far Eastern influence. And yeah, there are, there are, um, there are um, precedents for this, this, this kind of view in, um, in uh, Eastern thought. 
which is interesting, but not something I've, I've sort of looked at in any huge amount of depth. Okay, well, uh, once again, apologies to people whose questions I didn't get to, uh, but I think we've worked the speaker hard enough. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for showing up, uh, but I'd like most of all uh, to uh, thank uh, uh, Mark for giving this great presentation and um, we'll sort of imagine all the applause <laughs> that would have happened <laughs> were we present. So thanks again uh, to Mark and thanks again to everybody showing up and I hope you'll join us again next semester when we have a number more uh, of these presentations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.